and welcome to worship with La Jolla United Methodist Church. We're so glad and grateful that you are with us, whether you have been a part of this community for many years or whether you have found us for the first time today. It's important to us to get to know you, so we encourage you, again, whether you've been here a long time or this week is your first week worshiping with us, to check in via the virtual attendance card that is on our website. When you go to lahoyaunitedmethodistchurch.org slash online, uh, there should be a worship attendance card that pops up and we encourage you to sign in. Sign in with your name and your contact info and any prayer requests or, or comments that you have, we wanna hear from you. So be sure to check in there. There's a lot going on this week in the life of our church. There are always opportunities for missions, so I have a few announcements to share. The first one is that we are grateful to the McCrite family this week for the flowers on the altar. They are given in honor of Julia and Matt's birthdays and in loving memory of Rhoda Lentz on what would have been her birthday as well. So thank you, McCrites, and we celebrate the lives of your mother and your children with you. Our church conference is today, if you're watching this as it premieres on YouTube, it's today following our worship and fellowship time. So click on the link either in the journal or you can stay on the fellowship meeting. It's the same Zoom link for the fellowship time and for charge conference. In the worship edition of the journal that you got on Saturday, you will also find a link to our charge conference booklet. So if you have not already accessed that, please make sure you do so if you're going to join the charge conference. Or even if not, you can find reports on our various ministries, on our finances, on our outlook going forward. So we want you to know what's going on in the life of our church on the business end. And we want you to be a part of the conversation, so be sure to join in. Our uh, partnership with Pacific Beach UMC and their community outreach project, Project Grace, is uh, developing. So be sure to be on the lookout for more about that in coming weeks. Project Grace is a midweek meal for um, folks experiencing homelessness in the beach area. And there are also some medical services, dental services, some acupuncture that go on during non-COVID times, but some of that care also continues even in the midst of the pandemic. And it's really important work and we're excited to partner with PBUMC after a period of, um, of discussion and development of how we could be most useful. So make sure you check out our website, call the pastors or Stan Johnson if you have any questions about Project Grace, or you want to know how to get involved and serve. The Community Christian Service Agency is collecting donations for Christmas baskets this year. Now, this won't be um, happening in the same way as it usually does. So again, be on the lookout for information from Stan and others on the mission team about how you can participate in CCSA's ministry of feeding people who are hungry this Christmas. Um, you can make donations in a lot of ways, uh, online or by sending a check, but again, be on the lookout next week um, for info from Stan and the Christmas Basket Ministry folks. Every year, the nursery school has a project called The Giving Tree, where teachers in the classrooms uh, put out a wish list of things that they could use to make their classrooms more engaging and exciting, to make learning more fun and accessible to their students. So if you check out the journal, there's a link for uh, the nursery school's giving tree. We'll make sure that it's in the video and in the chat this week as well. It, this is a great, easy way for us to encourage our nursery school. It's been doing such good work, especially, especially in this time of pandemic. They continue to minister to our children through early childhood education, and it's really, really good, important, and hard work. So let's show them some support. Be sure to click through and choose an item or two or a whole classroom's worth of items and donate to the nursery school if you can. 
That's all the announcements. If there are any more, they'll be in the live chat or online. Let's continue in worship. Greetings, friends, from my uh, sister and her family's living room in South Sioux City, Nebraska, uh, sort of like the insert from the weekly video on, on Wednesday's journal. Um, I'm, I'm joining you, uh, recording from here, uh, but I'll be back in California on Sunday for our uh, live worship. I'll be in the chat and also for our charge conference. So uh, in the meantime, what a joy it is that we are able to, to worship in some uh, interesting ways uh, during a time such as this. I would invite you to join me in the call to worship. The words will be on your screen. How shall we enter the house of the Lord with songs of great praise and rejoicing? How shall we prepare ourselves to receive the blessings with hearts, minds, and spirits that are open? Come, let us worship the Lord and bow down. Let us offer our praise to God who has redeemed us. Amen. And now, friends, as the music plays, I would invite you to sing along with hymn number 203, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. <laughs> join me in the morning prayer. Everlasting God, you are our dwelling place from generation to generation, our shield from anguish and distress. You arm us as children of light with the hope of salvation, and you protect us by your love. Give us grace today and every day to build up and encourage one another as we seek wisdom and abundant life in the strength of your word and the assurance of your spirit. Amen. Hey everybody, it is children's time and we are continuing to build our Advent wreath this week. So if you are one of my younger friends or one of my friends or of any age and you'd like to come a little closer to the screen or maybe turn the volume up just a tiny bit so you can hear this is your time to learn about the Advent wreath and a little more about Advent. Now. You might remember from previous years or last week that usually in the Christian calendar for the last 
several hundred years, um, Advent has been four weeks long. It's the four Sundays before Christmas. So if Christmas on a, is on a Wednesday, then it will be the Sunday before that, and the Sunday before that, and the Sunday before that, and the Sunday before that. So very often, thanks, Thanksgiving is, um, the, is the holiday right before Advent starts. And Advent will begin um, on the Sunday right after Thanksgiving. But this year, we decided maybe we need a little extra time to prepare for Jesus in our lives. And so we are building the Advent wreath together. And then we will be able to light all the candles at the proper time. Now, usually we would light one candle on each Sunday and keep the other ones lit. So we would, on week one, light this candle. And then on week two, light these two candles. And then on week three, light the first three candles, including the pink one, that's week three. And then week four, light all four of these candles. But since we have an extra three weeks of Advent this year, we decided that a great process would be to build the wreath together for the first three weeks, and then we can start lighting candles. So we build our anticipation as we prepare our hearts and our spaces, our sanctuary and our homes, for Christmas. So the candles have special meanings, the wreath has a special meaning, and we can talk about that in later children's times, but I wanted to suggest that maybe in our homes this year for our extended Advent and for Christmas, we could do something in our homes like we are doing here in our sanctuary and building the Advent wreath up bit by bit. Maybe if you have a Christmas wreath with a bow, you could hang up just the wreath and add the bow later. Or maybe you have the materials to make an Advent wreath at home, or maybe you've signed up for our family Advent activity kit, which involves making an Advent wreath, and you too can build it bit by bit until it's time to light the candles. Or maybe you wanna get your Christmas tree, careful, a little bit early this year, and don't decorate it right away. Get the space all prepared and then buy the Christmas tree a little earlier than you might and, uh, and put it in water and make sure it has what it needs, but then not decorate it until you normally might decorate your tree. Or maybe you, you have lots of Christmas decorations that go around your house. Maybe build each of those up little by little as we prepare our hearts and our homes and our world for Christ's coming. Because this year has been so chaotic and different and strange that maybe we just wanna expand something that is already familiar and beloved in our, uh, in our celebrations, in our holidays. Maybe we wanna extend that a little bit and be really intentional and take a lot of thought and care as we prepare our homes the same way we prepare our hearts. So if you do that, if you decorate your own home in stages, I hope you'll share pictures. I hope you'll let us know what you've been doing. Uh, we will continue to build out our Advent wreath next week. And then the week after that, we will begin lighting candles. So I hope to see you next time. Friends, as we continue in worship, we move now into a time of prayer. And in this opening part of our prayer time, uh, we hear names of uh, persons connected with our congregation that we might hold in prayer. I would also invite you, as you hear these names, as you lift these persons in prayer, that you also remember those uh, names that you might have in your hearts, certainly those who are unnamed even in this list. Let us enter into this time of prayer. God, we pray for Fred. We pray for Lois, aunt of, of Judith. We pray for Chi and Grace and their children and grandchildren. We pray for Bob, father of Pamela, and Marilyn, his wife. We pray for Bruce, son of Deborah. We pray for those who are ill, those who are affected by the COVID-19 virus. 
We pray for our military deployed on ships who have been at sea and those overseas in other countries. We pray for Victoria, friend of Anne. We pray for David, cousin of Judith. God, we pray for those who mourn. We pray for Mary, friend of Sal. We pray for those fighting wildfires or enduring natural disasters or rebuilding from those. We pray for Colleen. We pray for Barbara, sister of Virginia. We pray for Stephen, neighbor of Lincoln. We pray for Bob, brother of Nick. We pray for the family of Jane, a friend of Diana. We pray for Dia, a friend of Merle. We pray for Jean, sister of Judith. We pray for Jonathan and family, son of Bob. We pray for Betty, aunt of Judith. We pray for Cynthia, mother of Dan. We pray for James. We pray for Marissa. We pray for David. We pray for Frank, grandfather of Karen. We pray for Ruth, mother of George Ann. We pray for Mark, friend of Julie. We pray for Denise, daughter of Evelyn. We pray for Lisa, daughter of Rita. We pray for the Cliff family, friends of Anne. We pray for Amphon. We pray for Courtney, daughter of Diane and David. We pray for the Haster family, friends of Anne. We pray for Jason. We pray for Joan and family. We pray for Emilio and family. We pray for Jennifer, for Marjorie, for Sherry, for Evelyn and family. We pray for Sandra's family. We pray for Kathleen's family and friends. We pray for Joseph and Helena. We pray for Alan, husband of Marjorie. We pray for Cindy and the Mark family. We pray for Lorraine, for Nancy, for Jean and Denise. We pray for Edna, grandmother of Lisa and Scott. We pray for Marty, brother-in-law of John. We pray for Kylie, friend of Karen. We pray for John and David, sons of Joan. Friends, we lift up in prayer all those who have been left unnamed, who we might name in our hearts before our God now. Friends, I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. The words will be on your screen. Merciful one, there are times we are insensitive to the world around us and to your promptings within us. Forgive us our ignorance and apathy and keep us alert and awake, especially when it is easier to fall asleep. We are the children of clarity amid the fog, armed with faith, love, and hope in Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? God of the universe, in whose sovereignty and plan we put our trust, today, like most days, this week, like many weeks, we come to you a bundle of hopes and dreams and fears and uncertainty. We very often don't know how to rely on ourselves or our families or our communities. Much less do we know how to rely on you. Help us to know. Help us to be assured, not beyond all doubt, because a little doubt we know is part of faith. But help us to be assured that you are with us even when the world around us seems chaotic or doesn't make any sense. 
Help us to really believe what Paul told your followers, that all things work together for the good of those who believe you. Help us, help us to be a part of that work. This week, this day, like every week and every day, we come with so much on our minds. We are anxious in our souls and in our bodies and in our minds about personal circumstances, challenges, community circumstances and challenges, relationships that are, are broken or failing or struggling. We seek your help, O oh God, your peace and your security in all of these. Make your presence known to us in their midst and help us to be your presence for others who are in our midst. We acknowledge and give deep and humble thanks for all of your good gifts. Especially, God, we are thankful for good and healthy and sustaining relationships in our lives. We're grateful for this beloved community to which we belong. We're grateful for the work to which you have called us. We're grateful for this planet we call home. Help us to care for all of these gifts you have given us. Help us to care for our relationships, our communities, our world, our planet. Amid all of our uncertainty, amid all of our struggle, amid all the challenge of this moment in time, oh God, we also rejoice in times and places of great joy. Babies are born and birthdays are celebrated and love grows. Families are formed and friendships prosper. The sky is blue or the rain falls. The ocean continues to meet the shore day after day in the most beautiful of relationships. We take joy in all of them and we give thanks. We know that too often we take things for granted, but we also stand in awe of the generosity and the love, the steadfastness that makes it all possible. We love you, oh God, because you love us and because of who you are. We love you for sharing yourself with us 
in each moment. And through the life and the love, the teaching, the death and the resurrection of your son, and through the action, the presence, the comfort, the whispers, the embraces of the Holy Spirit. We welcome you in every way we can into our lives. We invite you. We embrace you. We lift to you all of the names and circumstances that were read earlier. And we lift to you names that have not been added or spoken or written until this moment. You know their needs, you know our needs. Help us to understand what we can do, even if it is only to wait and hope and pray. We ask all these things in the name of the one who saves us and sets us free, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sometimes, when people find out that I was a Marine uh, about a decade ago, they ask if I miss it, if I miss being a United States Marine, a member of the military, or if I miss my job as a CH-53 Echo crew chief and crew chief instructor. And I have to admit, sometimes I do. I don't miss much the day-to-day -day of being a Marine, but I miss the family that I found there, the lifelong friends, the easy relationships, and I miss my job that I was really, really good at. I was a good crew chief and a good crew chief instructor. But what I especially miss about my job, that job, is knowing that I knew what to do in a given circumstance or if I didn't know what to do, at least I would know where to find the right answer. We had books, volumes of material that would tell us the right answer, how to handle anything that came up, how to troubleshoot, how to test the aircraft, what to do, in the case of an emergency, there's a whole section of what to do in the case of an emergency if it comes up. And so we had the answers. We knew where to find the answers to anything that might happen. And I really, really miss that. And I'll tell you, that big volume isn't the only resource. We had shelves and shelves of technical manuals for uh, repairs and, and where to order parts and, and how to submit a, a gripe on the aircraft. Just volumes of resources that would tell us how to do our work. And, and I miss that part a lot <laughs> because being a pastor, it's not the same. <laughs> So that's usually my answer. And I'll tell you, being prepared, learning what was in this book and all of those other books took a lot of time. The initial training for a crew chief on a, on a helicopter in the Marine Corps is about nine months after 
you're finished with boot camp, which is about three months, it's nine months of training on survival and, and water survival and how to be a mechanic and then how to be a crew chief. And, and it doesn't even stop after the nine months, right? We had to study and prepare and, and learn, if not what the answer was, at least where to find it. We had to become really familiar with all these resources and, and, and it was hard work. And, and, and we got examined regularly, right? We had annual, this, this book is called a NATOPS manual. NATOPS manual. And so we had NATOPS tests and a NATOPS check ride um, every year. And, and, and we had to do things that would keep up our qualifications and certifications. And, and that kind of thing was really anxious making at first, right? Your very first NATOPS check ride is a, an anxious, anxious experience. But, you know, we, we got used to it. We, we encountered situations where we had to put our training into use, and, and, and so we got more confident in ourselves and our abilities. I'll tell you, training never ended, you know? Uh, we, like I said, we got examined on an annual basis, and, and there were things that we had to, to do to keep up our qualifications, but there were also, you know, improved procedures that we would have to learn every so often, or a technical directive, or a modification to the aircraft that we would have to become familiar with. And so the training never ended, the preparation never ended, whether it was uh, kind of a general picture or the day-to-day -day preparation of knowing that your aircraft was ready. But we were well prepared for our job. In this letter to the Thessalonians, Paul is addressing the concerns of people who are concerned about the particulars of the second coming of Christ. They're anxious. They don't know when it's going to happen, and, and so they, they feel unprepared. And so Paul goes into this extended metaphor. He tells them, you, don't, you know as much as you need to know, but then he goes into this extended metaphor of day and night and waking and sleeping and drunkenness and sobriety and, and even living and death um, that, that serve to illustrate his point that you all are in Christ and you are more prepared than you seem to think you are for Christ's second coming. So let's hear these words from Paul to the Thessalonians read for us today. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep at night and for those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet of hope and salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I, I also want to share this passage from the message version, um, which is a paraphrase, but can be a really helpful way to hear the scripture. And, and I heard it this week, read during a worship service, and it was like a sermon all by itself. So I wanted to share it with you this week as well. Here is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 from the message. 
I don't think, friends, that I need to deal with the question of when this is all going to happen. You know as well as I that the day of the Master's coming can't be posted on our calendars. He won't call ahead and make an appointment any more than a burglar would. About the time everybody's walking around complacently, congratulating each other, we've sure got it made, now we can take it easy. Suddenly, everything will fall apart. It's going to come as suddenly and inescapably as birth pangs to a pregnant woman. But friends, you're not in the dark, so how could you be taken off guard by any of this? You're sons of light, daughters of day. We live under wide open skies and know where we stand. So let's not sleepwalk through life like those others. Let's keep our eyes open and be smart. People sleep at night and get drunk at night, but not us. Since we're creatures of the day, let's act like it. Walk out into the daylight sober, dressed up in faith, love, and the hope of salvation. God didn't set us up for an angry rejection, but for salvation by our master, Jesus Christ. He died for us, a death that triggered life. Whether we're awake with the living or asleep with the dead, we're alive with him. So speak encouraging words to one another. Build up hope so you'll all be together in this. No one left out, no one left behind. I know you're already doing it, this. Just keep on doing it. In, throughout this letter, there's a thread that runs that caught my attention this week about uncertainty and preparedness. There's a, a phrase that Paul uses that uh, was also used by the Roman Empire on its coins. Paul says, you have peace and security. And this phrase was printed, was minted on coins by the Roman Empire because Rome wanted its subjects to know why they had peace, and why they had security, and where it came from. Peace and security minted on your money came from Rome. But Paul's claim in this message is that we have a deeper peace and security Our hope, our assurance, our salvation comes from Christ. And it's deeper and more permanent than anything any empire can guarantee. To Paul wants the Thessalonians to know that they're already more prepared for anything that might happen than they think they are. They're already prepared for Christ's coming, even though they don't know when it will be. They already have their salvation. They're already alive in Christ, whether they're living or dead. Now, the Thessalonians were anxious about Christ's coming in the first century, and it hadn't happened yet, and so Paul is addressing their anxiety. 
You know, we, so much more than have this challenge 2,000 years later. The Thessalonians were anxious in the first century. We're in 2020, in the 21st century. And the second coming, the day of the Lord, doesn't seem to have happened yet the way that some of our apocalyptic scriptures say that it will happen. So in the 21st century, we're challenged to not become complacent, to not fall asleep, to stay awake, to be sober and careful and thoughtful and judicious. We're also challenged not to be anxious about a future of which we are certain, but whose arrival we cannot predict. I think Paul's message to the Thessalonians applies to us as well. We are more prepared than we think we are. Now, I told you about all the preparation I did as an aircrew person, an aircrew instructor, all the training and preparation to be good at my job and, and, and no matter how much preparation you do before your first flight, your first flight is jarring, amazing, <laughs> but jarring in, in the, the, the demonstration moment by moment that you, <laughs> that you don't know what you're doing. But after much more preparation, many more flights, a couple of deployments, I learned to rely on my training and my preparation, all the hard work that I had done. I learned to rely on my own instincts and the fact that that even if I wasn't prepared for a specific circumstance, that I still had what I needed to be able to get my crew and my aircraft home with our pilots and other crew members to get everyone and an aircraft home safely. We also need to be able to rely on our own preparation. None of this is to say slack off. Like I said, the training never ended. Paul says stay awake. John Wesley says that means keep your spiritual senses honed. The the preparation doesn't end. We can't become complacent. But I think We do need to rest, to rely on the fact that the work of redeeming us is done. Jesus has already done it. A favorite resurrection hymn says, love's redeeming work is done. Fought the fight, the battle won. It's, a, it's, a, it's an odd tension, right, between done already, but not fulfilled. We live in the in-between space, caught between two realities. 
Love's redeeming work is done. Christ has not returned as yet. So we want to be able to rely on our own preparation, rely on Christ's redemptive work, but not become complacent. We have peace and security. We have hope in Christ. We are made for salvation and not wrath. But how, how do we live in the in-between? Paul says, stay awake, but also maybe live like you mean it. Live like we believe that Christ's redemptive work really is done. Live like we do believe that our hope and our salvation are real and true and going to be fulfilled in the fullness of time. Paul says, encourage each other. Build each other up. Be there for each other in community. Live like people who do have hope. Keep awake. Keep aware. Be there for each other. Act like you have training. And we have charge conference, church conference, this day. And I have been reflecting, what a great opportunity both to trust in God's salvation, but also to stay alert and to build each other up, to encourage each other, to live as those who do have hope, to live as those whose salvation already is assured. I've, I've experienced church meetings that are used as gotcha moments. Or, or used to put people on the defensive. But that doesn't strike me as the ministry of people whose salvation is assured and who want to share that salvation with the world. Those moments aren't moments when we're encouraging each other and building each other up. What if... We put this into practice today at our own church conference. What if church meetings were an opportunity to encourage each other, to build each other up, to stay awake and aware, to not become complacent? What if even starting this afternoon, we acted that way? What if our church meetings were times when we talk about the potential of ministry that we could share in? What if our church meetings were times when we could congratulate people who are doing amazing work? What if our church meetings were times when we could rely on the fact that we have everything we need and that we're instead of times of complacency or anxiety, times when we build each other up I hope that this afternoon, and this week, and this year, and throughout our lifetimes, we will remember that we have everything we need, that our hope and our salvation is assured by the redemptive work 
of Jesus the Christ and that we act like we have some training. May it be so. Amen. Friends, as we have experienced worship in this time together, it is my hope that we have been moved by God's Spirit. And now is our opportunity to respond to the ways that God moves within us in this time of worship, in hearing sacred text, in hearing uh, uh, Pastor Leah's message this day. It is my hope that we are inspired, that we experience God's Spirit, and that we respond. Some of the ways that we respond, not only in terms of our prayers, our presence, our service, and our witness, uh, but also our gifts. And so as music is about to play, I would invite you to uh, perhaps get out your checkbook in an envelope and write a check made out to the church to drop in the mail tomorrow. Uh, perhaps you might want to go to our website uh, and, and give your gift online. Perhaps you might simply wish to, to send the amount uh, by text message to the number that you'll find on your screen. There are many ways to give to continue to support the vital ministries here at La Jolla United Methodist Church. And it is my hope that this time of worship has inspired you to respond.
friends, please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. The words will be on the screen. Generous God, we offer our gifts to you as tokens of our hope. Bless us and these gifts to be builders and encouragers of each other and your reign on earth. We pray in the name of the one who saves us. Amen. as we prepare to go on from our time of worship out into the world where we are invited to put our training into use, may we do so in the love and grace and wisdom and power and strength and peace of our triune God who created us, redeems us, and sustains us always. Amen. <laughs> 